ni igba akoko ninu eto iroyin wa nipa awon ilu ajeji ati awon opolopo ori zum ersten mal seit es unsere so for the first time since the start of our popular program other countries other customs we are revisiting a region we have already explored our viewers will recall our earlier expedition to the mysterious and virgin upper austria the material we brought back from that expedition was sensational the Kinshasa University Institute of Ethnology is still busy evaluating it. But there remains so much that was mysterious and inexplicable that we decided to return to the heart of Europe a second and a third time. This time we extended our research to the entire region of the Eastern Alps an area barely larger than Sierra Leone, and therefore small indeed by African standards. All the more surprising then was the abundance of groundbreaking discoveries we made. In the Tyrol we came upon warlike mountain tribes. Round Salzburg we found astonishing similarities with African traditions. We observed natives who belonged to an ascetic semi-suicidal cult previously unknown to ethnologists. Finally, we witnessed a mass invasion by neighboring tribes from the north. This and much more awaited us. Its evaluation meant much painstaking, unglamorous scientific work for us. As usual, we avoided the big cities, pushing rapidly forward into regions where no black man has ever set foot before. First, however, we went to see the four natives who were of invaluable service to us as guides and porters during our first journey. They are, as our regular viewers will know, brothers. Rudolf Himmelfreund Pointer, Sepp Himmelfreund Pointner, Karl Himmelfreund Pointner, Franz Himmelfreund Pointner. <laughs> Their touching childlike pleasure at seeing us again is quite understandable. The part they played in our now famous African film dragged them from obscurity and made local heroes of them. Their joyful mood vanished abruptly, however, when they were told that this time they were to accompany us to the tribal regions of the Salzburgers, Tyrolians, Styrians and Corinthians. Not until later did we learn that in the Eastern Alps, much as here in Africa, animosity, even hostility, exists between various tribes. Luckily, we had some of the magic paper that banishes all doubts and misgivings. The white man's tendency to indulge in narcissistic self-analysis makes ethnographic research in Europe very difficult. There is not one psychological or social phenomenon that has not been examined in scores of books. As soon as Europeans have written up their theories, they start to believe in them. If you read these works of egocentric self-justification, you risk being taken in by the elaborate style in which they are written and by the seemingly logical arguments. It's easy to end up thinking like the white natives that a curved line is straight, nonsense makes sense and the weird is normal. If you want to keep a clear head, avoid all white self-interpretation and rely on your own common sense. Individualism is often described as the main characteristic of the white race. Even in the more densely populated areas of the Eastern Alps, an African will immediately recognize the symbols of such individualism. Fences. Fences everywhere. They are too low to protect the dwellings from wild animals. They merely mark boundaries and send out the message, keep away, I want nothing to do with you. 
Jeder sucht sein Lebensglück für sich allein. The biological laws of reproduction sometimes compel the alpine natives to live together in groups, but only in the smallest possible ones. On our first journey, we succeeded in disproving the time-honored theory that the Central European tribes live monogamously. Each man has several women, but for reasons as yet unresearched, the auxiliary wives do not live in the same home as the main wife. I coined the scientific term dislocated polygamy for this form of cohabitation, and it has, I say it in all modesty, become a standard ethnological term. Individualism, to the extent that a person deems his or her own interests equal or even superior to those of his or her family, clan or tribe, is not held in Europe to be selfish or harmful to the community, but is widely accepted. Europeans even insist that this is the most refined form of human existence, despite the proof they themselves offer to the contrary. For the natives of the Eastern Alps are found in packs too. The pack behavior noticeable among all Alpine tribes clearly reflects a secret yearning to be seen as secure and protected members of a group. In packs, the inhabitants of the Alps like to indulge in music making, marching, and bizarre disguises. To recover from the pressures of individualism, they all dress alike. Once clad the same and marching in step to the hypnotic beat of the music, they seem to realize the advantages of pack existence. Why do Alpine people need rituals, disguises, ceremonial music and processions when they want to experience a sense of clanship? Among the tribes living in the steep mountains of the Tyrol, we observe several customs that made this question even harder to answer. When the people from this part of the country gather together, they arm themselves. Why? Whom are they fighting? The mountain folk of the Tyrol are known to be belligerent, like the Pashtuns of Afghanistan, or certain Bedouin tribes in the highlands of Yemen, whom we covered in earlier programs. But the Pashtuns and the Bedouins bear weapons in everyday life. Arms for them are the insignia of the free fighting man. In the case of the Tyroleans, weapons seem part of their disguise. These arms serve no practical purpose, they are mere objects of show. As ethnologists, we know this seemingly pointless firing into the sky to be a ritual, or maybe even part of a cult. Or does it merely stem from the desire to show off? The costumes would tend to suggest that. In their flashy boldness, they are reminiscent of the impressive plumage of some male birds. But whom do these men want to impress? Ethnological interpretations can be incorrect if the field of research is mapped out too narrowly in either geographical or temporal terms. Even I am not totally innocent in this respect. After three field trips, I feel obliged to revise, in certain minor details, my first impressions of the culture of these people. I have always refuted the view that Europeans do not possess culture in our African sense. To me, that is just another example of Afrocentrist arrogance. Our African culture revolves around song, dance and masks. European culture, on the other hand, and I don't mean to be disparaging, focuses on the written word and architecture. 
We use words in speech and song, whereas the Europeans put them in print, thus hoping to preserve them for eternity. Their buildings also seem intended to last forever, even when they no longer serve their original purpose. Let us think back to our first expedition. It was then we found evidence of a paradigm shift. The replacement of sacrificial lamb with sacrificial chicken. Our sensational research findings met with approbation all over the world. It appears that only the Central Europeans are not yet prepared to abandon their old prejudices. They steadfastly maintain that their religion contains no elements of death or mysticism. As a result of this shift, which may indicate the emergence of an entirely new religion, the old Christian temples stand empty. They continue nonetheless to be maintained. The desire so alien to us Africans to preserve everything forevermore must stem from the inability of Europeans to seize the moment as it flies and to enjoy the present while it is present. That may distinguish the whites from all other races. The Alpine tribes, however, are culturally more sophisticated than other Europeans and are, in this respect, surprisingly like us Africans. On our first journey to the Alps, we saw evidence of ancestor worship. Small statues placed outside the natives' houses clearly indicate an animistic belief system. My findings on the age-related differences in vocalism caused quite a stir in the scientific world. I found the songs of the young natives are bright and optimistic, whereas those of the older generation unceasingly lament the transience of the world and the pain of growing old. I also found evidence of a gender-related differentiation amongst these laments. The male voices are monotonous and melancholy, the women's shrill and aggressive. What I did not know on my first journey was that the Eastern Alpine tribes have masks too. In my original field of research, Upper Austria, they are less common than in Salzburg or the Tyrol. I'm not being arrogant when I say that, although the Europeans have masks similar to ours, it is quite apparent to every African that they do not understand their significance. They may indeed be unable to do so, as no European language has the words to express it adequately. The use of masks is primitive among the tribes of the Eastern Alps. Their primary function is to scare, which from an African point of view is the most unspiritual of all uses. Andre Malraux, a Frenchman, once wrote of African masks, Europeans know only that they are a door, but not where that door leads. Judging by what I've seen here, I'm afraid I won't be able to explain it to them either. When one is puzzled by a phenomenon, it is often helpful to look back at the past. Here in the Eastern Alps, we're dealing with racial mixing. The peoples are of Celtic, Slavonic and Mediterranean descent. Many tribes traversed the country, and many footsore and weary travellers chose to settle here. The religious beliefs of Palestine became interwoven with the pagan ideas of the north. Vastly differing ways of thinking and lifestyle mixed here into a hodgepodge, often barely intelligible to the locals themselves. This may be what underlies an often observed phenomenon, the pursuit of patently useless activities. The Eastern Alpine tribe settled here 1,000 years ago, but they didn't settle in the strict sense of the word. 
These people pedaling along so furiously are not trying to get from A to B. In fact, they have no goal. They're simply going for a ride, and at some point, they'll turn around and pedal back home. Mobility for mobility's sake. Exercise as an end in itself. Initially, we thought this was the deviant behavior of a few individuals. But we soon saw that this baffling migratory urge had assumed an epidemic proportion and gripped entire clans. Nomadic behavior assuredly, but unlike the Maasai of Kenya, it is not at the very core of their existence. It is a residual instinct, a deeply rooted subconscious reminder of a former nomadic modus vivendi. Useless activity performed compulsively is known as obsessional neurosis in European psychology. An appropriate term indeed for a phenomenon we observed during our third journey, which was undertaken in winter. Alpine winters are severe. Often the world seems paralyzed under snow and ice. But we know from our expeditions to the Arctic regions that human beings are able to adapt to hostile conditions to a surprising degree. However, no sensible Eskimo would leave his igloo in extreme cold except from sheer necessity. But the Alpine natives are different. In huge hordes, they compulsively move out into the snow and the cold. To what end? They stand and wait. In other respects, the people of the Eastern Alps are said to be possessed by a kind of impatience totally alien to us Africans. But here, they stand and wait patiently. For what? They have themselves pulled up a mountain slope. Why? Just to slide down it again. They have themselves pulled up, they slide down. Up, down, up, down. In innovating monotony, sometimes for a whole day. And they even pay for it. Ni opolopo iba. Ni man biara mi wipe kini dire. I was pondering over why this puzzling behavior seems so familiar when, in the film archives of Kinshasa, I chanced upon a scientific film on infantile behavior. The similarities in the patterns of behavior are striking. 
The phenomenon documented here is well known to psychologists. When mature adults relapse into an earlier stage of development and behave like children, we talk of regression. The masses of people moving up and down the slope can only be described as regression on an epidemic scale. By and large, we regard European civilization as being highly advanced, and if we take its Mediterranean origins into account, very old. But just as many people may grow childish in their old age, advanced civilizations that are drawing to a close are prone to regressive tendencies. The mountains and the valleys of the Eastern Alps are more than just the scene of infantile games. Deep down in their souls, the natives have been molded by the landscape. Their horizon is obstructed by mountain ranges, which, as we saw during our first expedition, affects their mindset. Or as the old pygmy proverb says, you can think only as far as you can see. We decided to dedicate more time to researching the mountains. Occasionally, the natives ascend the mountains in order to expand their horizons for a few precious hours. Throughout the Alps, they have created comfortable means of escaping the physical and mental confines of the valleys. But not everybody takes the easy way. Many a native turns up his nose at the chairlifts and cable railways, refusing comfortable paths to the top and opting for a steep and unwelcoming wall of rock instead. Why? Yet more pointless, obsessive, compulsive activity? We should take care not to jump to conclusions. For what is going on here? compared to the winter sliding up and down, is connected with extreme physical exertion and grave danger. Why do alpine humans struggle so hard and take such risks? I thought back to my journey to the Himalayas, where wise men climb high into the mountains in search of divine inspiration in ascetic solitude. But as far as I could observe, the natives of the Alps never climb alone. And they do not look at all enlightened when they descend from the heights. As I expected, they answered my questions about what drew them to the peaks evasively and in empty phrases. This is invariably a reliable indicator that a subject of enormous significance has been raised. For all over the world, natives try to conceal their most important rites and cults from strangers. To find an answer to my questions, we had to climb the mountains ourselves to simplify matters and avoid pointless exertion by helicopter. My assumption was quickly confirmed. Even the inhabitants of the Eastern Alps, however mundane they seem, need a transcendental motive for such exertions. The peaks are adorned with crosses, the symbol of Christianity. Enormous hardship even risk to life are endured to be near that precious symbol. And so mountaineering, as the natives call this activity, which at first seems so meaningless, turns out on a closer inspection to be a religious practice. We owe the discovery that this ritual did not originate in Christianity, but in an older cult usurped by Christians to a lucky coincidence.
Shortly before our journey to the Eastern Alps, the frozen remains of a mountaineer were discovered. They were found to be more than twice as old as Christianity, much older even than Judaism, from which Christianity split off. So we have in fact two entirely different cults here, the ascetic mountain cult and an orgiastic one, which we will just briefly re-explain. In the warm, or by African standards, moderately warm season, huge tents are erected in the villages of the Eastern Alps. The entire male population of the village takes part in the construction, a common task undertaken with more enthusiasm than their daily work. We were unaware at the time of our first journey that these tents are erected annually and are the venues of cultic festivals. At first sight, swilling beer seems to be the only point of the exercise. The natives drink all through the night. With short interruptions for sleep, they keep on drinking for two days and three nights. They seem to be under a compulsion to consume as much beer as possible, although this beverage does not seem to agree with all of them. Many a native leaves the tent for a while and vomits hastily, only to return and consume further vast quantities of beer. We now know that the tribes of the Eastern Alps also incline to alcoholism in everyday life. But here, during these beer tent festivals, the consumption of the largest possible volume of alcohol seems to be absolutely compulsory, and he or she who shirks this sacred duty is shunned by the community. The ethnologist quickly recognizes these festivals as having much in common with cults found in other parts of the world. They begin with a communal meal, followed by a phase of fraternization, during which the Alpine natives, individualists that they normally are, seek community and togetherness. In phase three of the strictly regimented course of events, there is dancing. Then, nearing the climax of their orgiastic exuberance, they have danced and drunk themselves into a trance. There is not much left of the slowness often attributed to the Alpine tribes. They step out of character. They cross the inhibiting boundaries of their own personalities, as is typical of the states of trance aimed at in so many cults around the world. Sometimes, but not always, the religious nature of events becomes obvious. Jesus, Kindlein, bleib bei mir, trink a glass of wine with me. Originally the most important ritual of Christianity was a totemic meal. It was dedicated to a young god who had been crucified and risen from the dead. They ate his flesh and drank his blood. The totemic animal symbolically representing that young god was the lamb, later replaced by bread and wine. Now the old stone buildings stand empty, the cult is practiced in tents, and beer is drunk instead of wine. And this was the brilliant discovery we made. Chicken has replaced lamb as the sacrificial animal. In honor of the Godhead, a special ceremonial dance has been created, the chuk. The flapping of a chicken's wings is recreated, imitatio dei, as white theologians would say. People identify with chickens and thus become one with the sacrificial animal and with the God it represents. Sensational discoveries such as these are rare. To witness the emergence of a new religion is an unforgettable moment in the life of an ethnologist. 
I regret to say, however, that the natives took narcissistic affront at our work. Without having the slightest shred of evidence for it, they continued to regard their religion not as a syncretistic uniting of disparate strands, but as the religion to end all religions, incomparable and unique. But that's by the by. Everywhere else outside Europe, our findings were received most warmly, and they constitute a highlight in my career as an ethnologist. I never dared hope we would make two truly significant discoveries on one and the same field trip, but that is exactly what we managed to do. Early summer in the eastern Alpine valleys. The weekend is drawing near. The country is quiet. The natives are going about their daily work. Some of them are practicing the traditional cults and rites we have already observed. Nothing indicates something major is about to happen, but all of a sudden, it does. Huge hordes from the north have begun to move towards the eastern Alps. An invasion, there can be no other word for it, is about to take place. From several border crossings, the raiders from the north push forward into the region of the eastern Alpine tribes. The natives seem paralyzed by shock. So far, there are no signs of resistance to the invasion. More and yet more vehicles are rolling across the border. Soon there is not enough space for them all, and the traffic is jammed. It looks as if the local tribes have been taken completely by surprise by their northern neighbors. There are no signs of resistance, no attempts at self-defense. Some of the invaders are traveling with kith and kin and appear quite harmless. Others, however, are a terrifying sight. are penetrating even deeper into the country. Their advance is slow, but inexorable. The invaders do not seem to have a common destination. They spread out all over the country. In the towns and villages in which they finally stop, they are received courteously. The behavior of the indigenous population is submissive. They offer the invaders accommodation as if they were naturally entitled to it. Our astonishment at this course of events is understandable in view of what we observed on our first expedition to the Alps. Then the local populace was struck by an overwhelming xenophobia.
remote areas, the natives even went into hiding. Sometimes we felt as if we had entered a deserted country. This impression was constantly reinforced during our early expeditions. The woods were eerily still. We heard and saw nothing, and yet we knew the alpinas were there. Just occasionally, we caught a glimpse of one. This time, when the invaders arrived in small groups, the locals appeared afraid and avoided them. But when the invaders arrived in large cohorts, the natives acted as if they had been eagerly awaiting them. We attributed this behavior to a pragmatic strategy of kowtowing before an all-powerful opponent. In many places, enormous houses have been built in readiness for the invaders, who take possession of them like a birthright. What forces are at work here? Are the Alpine tribes historically obliged to provide dwellings for their northern neighbors? The locals tolerate the interlopers. They bow down before them and wait on them, but they certainly don't like them. So much is obvious to the eye of the trained observer. We were able to establish that this village housed ten times more intruders than locals. The role of the locals seems to be to pander to the wishes of the strangers. No matter what the wishes of these people from the north are, there is always a native on hand to oblige them. The longer we observe this strange pattern of conduct, the more convinced we became that the invaders simply had time to kill. Sometimes, though, members of the northern tribes hire locals to guide them up the mountains and join reverently in this important indigenous ritual. The invaders also particularly enjoy taking part in the local beer tent festivals. With religious fervor, they enter into a contest with the locals to see who can consume the greater quantities of beer. Do these men, women and children from the north move to the valley of the Alps for two or three weeks a year for spiritual reasons? Are these people, whom we took to be invaders, in reality believers in the new Alpine religion we have uncovered? Much would seem to suggest this. The invaders are prepared to subject themselves to considerable discomfort during their annual pilgrimage to the Alps. We have visited their home regions and observed that, by and large, they live in spacious dwellings. Here, however, entire families cram into one small room and even pay for it, for we discovered that the strangers must make an oblation to the Alpine villages. For several weeks, we did little else but research all these strange phenomena. But every question we answered spawned new questions. Every puzzle we solved opened up new puzzles. We had previously thought the primitive Alpine peoples displayed such a wide range of astonishing customs as could barely be surpassed by anyone. When the sun shines, which rarely happens in the Eastern Alps, they lie down in rows in the open air, with the peculiar goal of tanning their white skins. The evaluation of this custom will keep ethnologists busy for some time to come. Haven't the Europeans always based their sense of superiority to other races on the color of their skins? And now they're trying to look like us Africans fully aware that they'll never succeed. In 
in the past, luckily long gone, when the whites ruled over Africa, their missionaries forced our women to cover their naked breasts. Here, European women are displaying their breasts. And in contrast to our more innocent African traditions, the sexual appeal is all too obvious. And the signals do not go unanswered. Young natives perform a mating dance in front of the invaders. Any expert in the language of dance will recognize these grotesque movements as an invitation to sexual congress. It is no secret that mating is frequent between muscly young alpiners and female raiders from the north. Are we to believe that the virility of the mountain males is what really brings the northerners here? True, many male invaders from the north seem somewhat limp and emasculate. If our hypothesis is correct, this will be the first sexually motivated migration of peoples to be documented in the history of ethnology and will give a new meaning to the word wanderlust. The distinction between a serious ethnologist and a charlatan is that the ethnologist is not content with simple answers to complex questions. One simple theory, which I have heard many times on my journey to the Alps, claims that there is one underlying cause for all the strange behavioural patterns we have observed. The white man's insatiable greed for money. The person, for example, struggling along on his bicycle is a victim of the industry which sold him the bicycle and cycling garb. Likewise, winter mountain sliding, the ritualized tent festivals and the business of wanderlust are all merely about making money. I cannot and will not endorse that theory, for it would mean classifying the inhabitants of the Alps as pure materialists and denying their thoughts and deeds a spiritual dimension. Coming up with answers is not the purpose of our expeditions. Our aim is to collect data which will be analysed and interpreted in long-term and painstaking scientific work. In that respect, our three journeys to the Central European Alps were most rewarding. The material we unearthed is, if I may say so, excellent and at times positively sensational. Will all the questions we have raised be answered one day? I rather doubt it. The Alpine tribes, and indeed all Europeans, will always remain something of a mystery to us. Good evening, and my best wishes till the next time you watch Other Countries, Other Customs. Kayonga Kagame shows us the world. Well, that's a great example of being able to laugh at yourself. Next week on TV World, AIDS in India, a film lauded at the Sydney Film Festival and with a number of awards to its credit. I hope you'll join me then.